ladies and gentlemen, we will begin. If you will please take your seat. <laughs> the challenge is always corralling everybody back in the room. Well, again, thank you, and uh, many thanks to, to Vince Rigby giving us a great uh, kickoff, uh, uh, really a tour de force of, of a very robust agenda. So our first panel is going to be a combination of both views from government, views from experts about the Canadian chairmanship, the story so far. Uh, and we have an excellent uh, group of, of panelists, and uh, I, in some ways, some of these panels should be seminars unto themselves, uh, but uh, we'll be very mindful, giving panelists about eight to ten minutes to provide opening remarks. I'll moderate a discussion among them for the first 15 minutes or so, and then I'm going to unleash this wonderful audience on them for tough, tough questions. So we are uh, incredibly honored to have the Premier of Nunavut, Peter Taptuna, who also serves as the Minister of Executive and Intergovernmental Affairs and the Minister respons Responsible for Aboriginal Affairs. Um, in addition to having an extraordinary uh, uh, career in, in the Nunavut government. Uh, many of you may not know that Premier Teptuna has also worked in the oil and gas industry for over 13 years and served as one of the uh, the first and only all Inuit drilling crew on an offshore rig in the Beaufort Sea. So someone with both the, the economic development experience as well as government experience. We are absolutely delighted to welcome Sue Harper back to Washington. We claim her as one of our own. Uh, Sue has served uh, in the Canadian Embassy here in Washington as the Minister for Economic Affairs. So we are so delighted you are back. Sue serves as the Director General and the Senior Arctic Official for Canada uh, and is uh, and the Director General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development Canada. She served a very distinguished career uh, in trade policy uh, as well and served as amb Ambassador of Canada to Uruguay. So Sue, we're, we're delighted to have you here. Now sort of shifting to my right, we uh, are pleased to have Okalik Igisiak, and please forgive me if I've uh, mispronounced that. Uh, Ms. Igisiak is the chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Um, she has served uh, as a distinguished background in the Inuit community in a variety of senior roles, a tireless advocate for Inuit rights, interests, and aspirations. She has served in a variety of, of important positions uh, in the Inuit Broadcasting Corporation and very other, various other uh, corporations. So we are, again, so grateful to have such a, a strong voice as a permanent participant as well, the Arctic Council. Moving to my right, we have uh, Dr. Alexander Shostakov, uh, is the director of the World Wildlife Fund's Global Arctic Program based in Ottawa, and Sasha is the WWF representative to the Arctic Council. We uh, in the uh, think tank and expert community uh, are so grateful. Sasha is a prolific writer on the Arctic, so insightful, uh, has been an expert for the Russian parliament on environmental law issues. He served as a member of the official Russian delegation to a number of international environmental conventions. So uh, uh, the World Wildlife Fund has a true treasure in Sasha, and we're awfully glad that uh, you are here with us. Thank you. And last but not least, we had a last minute substitute uh, colleague, uh, unfortunately had an emergency, could not be with us, but we have Dr. Andrea Sharon with us, assistant professor and deputy director of the Center for Defense and Security Studies at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Sharon has uh, written extensively on the Arctic uh, and, and a variety of issues uh, related to, to safety and security uh, in the Arctic, and we are delighted that she can offer uh, her insights. She's also worked uh, in several Canadian federal departments, including the Privy Council uh, Secretariat. So again, what incredible depth. Uh, and so we will begin with Premier Taptuna, and we're going to work our way down the table, and uh, so the chairmanship, the story so far, and Premier Taptuna, you can begin with chapter one, the story from Nunavut. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ms. Connolly, and I thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity to be uh, speaking to you here this morning. I thank the organizers. I'm very pleased to be part of this panel. It gives me an opportunity, it gives us an opportunity to talk about accessing the present, 
and shaping the future for the betterment of all Northerners and people of our great countries. Nunavut is a proud member of uh, the Circumpolar World. I want to talk a little bit about Nunavut. It's, it's over 2 million square kilometers. It's a huge territory. In other words, 808,000 square miles. So it is a huge territory. It's, a, it's one of the newest territories in Canada. It's 15 years old this year. And it's over 20% of Canada's land mass and two-thirds of Canada's coastline. Not only that, we have 18% of Canada's fresh water. In other words, we're very, very big. <laughs> but our population is very small. We have a population of 36,400 spread among 25 communities throughout our vast territory. So it's always a challenge to bring in infrastructure and provide services for our smaller communities that we have around Nunavut. In other words, we have to build 25 of everything, 25 schools, 25 health centers, 25 airstrips, and the list goes on. It, it's a huge cost. For over 4,000 years, Inuit lived in this geo, uh, geographical area, which of course is now known as Nunavut. And in 1993, the land claims agreement was signed. This was the largest, most comprehensive modern day treaty of the time. And in 1999, that gave us an opportunity to form the government of the territory. Last year, I became the Premier of Nunavut, and my primary focus is to ensure that our communities are sustainable and prosperous. And we all know in order to do that, we have to be an active part of the world economy. Nunavut, as I indicated yesterday, has a wealth of resources and immense potential in many economic sectors, including oil and gas, mining, commercial fisheries, arts and crafts, and to a certain degree, tourism. At the moment, although we boast over 20% of the potential minerals in our territory compared to Canada, we have only two operating mines one operating for gold. And I believe we have some technical difficulties with our slideshow. <laughs> it was a fast slideshow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other one, of course, that just opened is on Baffin Island, Baffin Iron Ore. And that started production, stockpiling just last week. I spoke about that a little bit yesterday where the iron ore there is just sitting on surface. So rather than calling it mining, we, I think we should be calling it core because it's all that iron ore just sitting on surface there. And there's been eight other mining projects in advanced stages of exploration. Their completion is expected to go into production in about 10 years' time. On average, they will require $14 billion worth of investment in construction and machinery. They'll need 7,500 7, workers for their operation and construction. And they'll be producing $8.5 billion worth of minerals on an annual basis and have an operational cost, of course, salary and operational cost of $3.5 billion annually. In addition, there are 33 other exploration activities that's happening in Nunavut in various stages of um, advancement. At, and all these companies are focused on every type of mineral that you can think of. Gold, precious, diamonds, base metals, uranium, and so forth. Last year, in the mineral exploration expenditures in our territory it may seem like a small amount, $250 million, but that puts us forth amongst the big mining jurisdictions like Ontario, British Columbia, Quebec, and Saskatchewan. Additionally, discovered pet petroleum resources in Nunavut amount to 2 billion barrels of crude oil, 
and 27 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. There are currently 20 licensed fields, mostly in the Serb Drupta uh, Basin. There's a small oil production between 1986 and 1996 at the Benthorn on a camera now up in the high Arctic. You know, it is estimated to have approximately a third of Canada's total petroleum resource. Undiscovered resources, estimated by Geological Survey of Canada, are believed to be many times higher than that. There's historical geological data that suggests vast resources in Nunavut's three dozen sedimentary basins that imply a huge economic potential for future exploration and development. Estimates of the undiscovered conventional resources range from 25 to 267 billion barrels of oil and between 285 to 1,230 trillion cubic feet of gas. The initiatives that the Arctic Council has taken during Canada's chairmanship will assist us in developing these industries and allow Arctic communities to prosper and retain their cultural and traditional values at the same time. Nunavut's history in the involvement of the Arctic Council starts at the very beginning. The capital of Nunavut, Iqaluit, which is snowing there today, <laughs> was the location of the very first ministerial Arctic Council ministerial meeting in 1998. And we're very pleased that Iqaluit will host the next ministerial meeting in April under Canada's chairmanship. The government of Nunavut is committed to Arctic Council and is supportive of Canada's chairmanship theme of development for the people of the North. I am proud, str proud of the strong leadership of the Canadian chairmanship by my fellow Nunavut mute, the Honourable Minister of Arctic Council, Leona Agluka. She has taken Arctic Council down a new path which led to a successful facilitation of the creation of Arctic Economic Council. The people of the North are Canada's greatest asset in the Arctic, and this new forum will foster increased engagement of private sector and Arctic governance. It will be a valuable source of advice and expertise from this committee, from this council, and both governments and private sector will be looking for input from their expertise. Newwood also supports a mental wellness project that was initiated under Canada's leadership. We are co-hosting a symposium on mental wellness in the Kaluit in the spring of next year. Newwood is very supportive and engaging the work that Arctic Council has done with respect to marine safety in the Arctic. Shipping through the Arctic increases every year and we need to ensure that the ships passing through the Arctic waters meet the necessary standards for Arctic shipping and Arctic conditions. We also need to be prepared for and take steps to prevent oil spills in Arctic waters. The work, in, the work that the Arctic Council has done in oil spill prevention and response will help to ensure that oil and gas development in the Arctic is sustainable. The Arctic Council's work during Canada's chairmanship supports the development of sustainable circumpolar communities. We hope this work will continue into the U.S. US chairmanship. As Nuno continues to engage in, in stronger circumpolar relations and greater partnerships, we will build our territory strength and make our best effort to address our challenges. We look forward to hearing what the focus and priorities of 2015-2017 U.S. Chairmanship will be. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Tepchina. That was fantastic, and those statistics are, are just uh, mind-blowing. Thank you for sharing. Sue. Thank you, Heather, and uh, I'd like to uh, echo the thanks to CSIS and CG for organizing this event today and uh, 
especially for putting together a panel that, from our point of view, reflects exactly the approach Canada likes to take in the Arctic Coun Council, which is um, one of collaboration among the governments, the indigenous people of the Arctic region, business, civil society, and scientific experts. So uh, this is uh, esteemed company and, and certainly um, good to have all these different perspectives on the question. We've just heard from the chair of the senior Arctic officials about the importance of evolution in the council and of taking a longer term view of the work we accomplished there. And he provided you with the overview of Canada's priority chairmanship initiatives and our collective progress in working toward their implementation. So uh, for my part in the next few minutes, I'd like to focus a bit more on the importance of consensus building, both domestically and within the council, and the importance of cooperation and continuity in the council. As a famous man once said, all politics is local. When considered in a multilateral context, this quote reminds us that we are always balancing the need to satisfy our own domestic priorities with those of our international partners. Within the Arctic Council, which is of course a consensus-based organization, each chairmanship has a special responsibility to work to strike this balance while also considering the long-term interests of the organization. In formulating Canada's chairmanship priorities, we were guided by our main Government of Canada Arctic policies, that is, Canada's northern strategy and Canada's Arctic foreign policy, excuse me, foreign policy, where the focus is on four pillars, protecting Canada's environmental heritage, promoting economic and social development, exercising Canada's sovereignty, and improving and devolving governance. But we were also guided by the views and needs of those living in Canada's north. We knew we had to build consensus from within before we attempted to build consensus with our partners. That is why Minister Agluka consulted extensively across Canada's three territories in developing our chairmanship priorities, where she met with premiers and other elected representatives, Aboriginal peoples, business, research institutions, municipalities, and NGOs. Underlining their key role in building Canada's Arctic Council policies, it is most apt that political representatives from all three territorial governments are participating in today's event and are able to share their own perspectives. Now, I should add that for many years, we've been using a special consultative body we call the Arctic Council Advisory Committee to bring together representatives from our Canadian permanent participant organizations, our three territories, and our Government of Canada departments and agencies involved in Arctic issues. Here we exchange information, prepare for senior Arctic officials meetings, and support the capacity building of our permanent participant delegations. This committee is so important to our process that it is even mentioned specifically in Canada's Arctic foreign policy. So once we completed our internal process, the next step was to seek the consensus of our Arctic Council partners. During these consultations, which happened at both the ministerial and senior Arctic official levels, we found broad and enthusiastic support by all Arctic Council members to focus on a suite of economic, social, and environmental initiatives that benefit people from across the circumpolar north. This approach resonated with our partners. While we may all not live in the Arctic, we are all Arctic nations and we share similar challenges in our more northern areas. We also share the desire to see the work of the Council make a difference. As the Chair of the Senior Arctic Officials emphasized, the Council needs to be strong and to be relevant. We believe in the importance of continuously working to strengthen the Arctic Council, including by carrying out tracking and archiving projects, working closely with the Arctic Council Secretariat, building co collaborations with other multilateral fora, and enhancing the capacity of the permanent participants. And on that last point, I'd like to emphasize that for us, this unique and fundamental feature of the Arctic Council is one of our strengths, and we have to continually work to ensure that we are supporting our permanent participant organizations. We also believe that the Council needs to continuously evolve to meet changing needs, including by strengthening its work on the human dimension. I think we're all aware that life in the North brings with it a unique set of challenges, ranging from high costs of goods and services to various environmental health and economic challenges. 
These, of course, can vary depending on where in the Arctic one is situated, but at a basic level, the people of the North are the same as people everywhere else. They need the opportunities to support themselves and their families in a healthy environment. And they need respect, not just within their own countries, but also from the broader international community. Let me share with you a concrete example of what that means from a Canadian perspective. Last year, construction commenced on the last section of the Dempster Highway, which connects the Klondike region of the Yukon, which already has good connections to the rest of North America, to the deep water port of Tuktoyuktuk. This project should enhance economic prosperity not only in Canada's north, but also in Alaska and other regions. At, this Ar at the Arctic Council, this economic element is best seen in our facilitation of the creation of the Arctic Economic Council, the AEC. We have been clear that this work be undertaken with a view to the people of the North who need sustainable economic development to create opportunities closer to home and to improve their quality of life. The business representatives of the Arctic states and permanent participants who founded the AEC in September in Iqaluit have reflected this in their discussions establishing the body. They have committed to working with both business and government to enhance circumpolar trade and sustainable development and support business in the Arctic, including Indigenous business. Now, some have said that Canada's focus on the human and economic dimensions of the Arctic Council's work is moving the Council away from its foundational scientific assessment and environment work. But we would respectfully disagree. In fact, we would argue it enhances it. The environment is of deep concern to the people of the North. They feel the effects of environmental problems most acutely and are determined to seek solutions that balance the many needs of the Northern people. And our chairmanship initiatives to address black carbon and methane emissions, to build a climate change adaptation portal, to conserve migratory birds, and to enhance scientific co cooperation amongst the Arctic states were all designed to help find some of these solutions. Let me share another example of how work in the Arctic Council reflects our domestic priorities. This one relates to our commitment to Arctic science. Just last month, the Prime Minister broke ground on the new Canadian High Arctic Research Station in Cambridge Brain Nunavut, which will provide a world-class research facility for Canadian and international scientists with a view to improving the economic opportunities, environmental stewardship, and quality of life of people throughout the Arctic region. As we're getting close to the end of our term as chair, we are beginning to turn our attention to the transition to the U.S. chairmanship. We are working with our American counterparts to determine which of our priority initiatives will be wrapped up and which may be incorporated into U.S. priorities or ongoing Arctic Council work. We plan to meet on a regular basis over the coming months as we work to ensure a smooth transition process. Before concluding, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that current Canada-U.S. cooperation re regarding the Arctic Council follows a long line of Arctic cooperation between our two countries. Only months after Pearl Harbor, Canada and the U.S. reached an agreement to build a highway over 1,000 miles long through Canada's dense wilderness to Alaska, to, through Canada's dense wilderness to Alaska in order to shore up the, the continent's defenses. This highway has contributed significantly to the economic growth of Canada's Western Arctic. On the other side of the Canadian Arctic, Iqaluit, which is the capital of Nunavut, and as you've just heard, uh, the location of next year's ministerial, was a principal staging point for the U.S. Air Force and an alternative landing site for the space shuttle. When faced with a different threat, Canada and the U.S., along with Denmark and Iceland, cooperated in building the dew line. After September 11th, cooperation excelled between our two countries, notably along the Alaska-Yukon border, where we worked to ensure the continued free flow of people and goods. While the preoccupations driving Arctic cooperation change over time, the need for cooperation does not. We are looking forward to a successful process leading to the ministerial and throughout the U.S. chairmanship. We look forward to working with our American friends as well as our other Arctic Council partners in this process. Thank you.
Sue, thank you so much. I love that consensus, cooperation, continuity. That's, a, that's the title of a think tank report. I love it. I may have to steal that. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate your comments. I think it's absolutely perfect. We can now turn to permanent participants and their view uh, of how the Arctic Council has evolved uh, through the Canadian chairmanship. So, Ms. Yuziak, we are delighted that you are here. Please. <clears throat> Um, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for arranging this event in beautiful Washington and for me to participate. I'm Ukalak I think you. I think you pronounced it pretty well. Oh God bless you. <laughs> Very generous and kind. <laughs> And I'm from Nunavut as well. Uh, Vince put it perfectly uh, when he spoke. I'm from the heart of Canada's north, from Iqaluit. <laughs> I usually say uh, the center of the universe. <laughs> that works too. <laughs> <laughs> and like Vince, I'm fairly new to the job. I was just appointed in July when we had our General Assembly in Inuvik. Um, so uh, like the Admiral that was just appointed and Vince <laughs> who is also new, I'm very new as well. In the, our international people, ICC International, Inuit Circumpolar Council International represents more than 150,000 Inuit in Chicago, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. Our relationship at ICC is based on a common culture and language. Conferences like this are very good opportunities for me to hear from people who have been close to the work of the Council over the past few years. ICC has been very fortunate that a lot of our um, uh, advisors at the international and uh, country level have continued to be involved, like Terry Fedge is here in the room. Uh, he was an advisor to Sheila Wak-Cloutier, and he still works with the file uh, uh, with other per permanent participants. I'm especially pleased to have a chance to meet some of the American team who will, who will very soon be taking the leadership of the council. Even though I'm new to the Arctic Council, I'm not new to Arctic issues affecting Inuit, just like you're not new to Arctic issues with your previous work. My, my comments today are therefore not intended to review and analyze the Arctic Council. I want to focus more on matters of importance to Inuit into the future including our role in the Arctic Council. The Arctic today is experiencing unprecedented, unprecedented attention, just like Sue was saying and what Vince was saying this morning. As we face unprecedented globalization, I often think about how Inuit envisioned the Arctic in 2020, 2050, and beyond. Of course, this is why ICC was established and created. To a lot of people, the Arctic is a remote and empty place. Many interested parties are trying to design new ways to govern the Arctic, new ways to extract its wealth, and new ways to travel through the region. Inuit give the Arctic a human face, but we constantly have to remind the world that we are here or there. We have our own systems of governance already, Inuit in Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, have negotiated our respective, with our respective national governments to, to secure a range of political, social, and, and economic rights. Things have not progressed as much in Chicago, as we all know. In any case, we don't see a governance vacuum in the Arctic. In the Arctic Council, there's a lot of work going on. Working groups and task forces are thinking about issues like climate change, marine transportation, non-renewable resource development, transboundary pollution, and Arctic biodiversity. As Inuit, we do not think about these issues in a detached, scientific way. These issues and many others affect us day to day. We look at these issues, issues from the perspective of what impact they will have on our language, our culture, and traditions, and on the future of our children and communities. In order for us to contribute to the sustainable development of our communities, we need to ensure a healthier, housed, and experienced Inuit labor force. The potential of a diversified Arctic economy in non-renewable 
and renewable resource development must be matched by educated and trained Inuit. And it is criti critically important that Inuit are grounded by our culture and our, and our respect for the lands and waters where we live. I think this represents a very different perspective than the one taken by many of the government officials and scientists who participate in Arctic Council activities. So now let me say a few things about my impressions of Canada's chairmanship of the Arctic Council so far. The theme of Canada's chairmanship program is development for the people of the North. And Minister Agluka has stressed that Canada wants to put the interests interests of Northerners first. And we, we, like Vincent and Susan and uh, Peter uh, have said, we're very fortunate to have Leona at the table. Her being from Nunavut, from a small town, uh, she's from Joe Haven. But we have to remember that she won't be there forever, right? Governments do change. Inuit needs don't change. So please keep that in mind. From the perspective of Inuit, as Susan was saying, it was good to hear her say that uh, she recognized the resource challenges that we have as permanent participants as, and as ICC uh, in our respective countries and as an international organization. There's an almost overwhelming amount of important work going on in the Arctic Council on top of the other things that ICC does as well. With our limited resources, we struggle to keep up. We don't currently have the capacity to attend and contribute in all working groups and activities as much as we would like. So we are watching to see if there is substantial progress on issues like the permanent participant capacity building workshop that will be taking place in Yellowknife in October. In my view, it is critically important that ICC continues to play a strong role in forums, forums like the Arctic Council. As an organization, ICC predates the Arctic Council by about 20 years. In the 1970s, our Inuit leadership saw the need for us to come together to deal with exactly the kinds of challenges we are facing today. But as Inuit, we have always understood that changing the Arctic brings opportunities as well as challenges. As the international chair of ICC, it is my duty to stand up for, the, for sustainable Inuit communities with organizational capacity. And we have always been incredi incredibly resistant, resilient, and capable of adapting to cha challenging environments and successive governments. Um, with Canada's um, work into the Arctic Council and the program of development for the people of the North, I'd like to suggest that America carry that even further and say development with the people of the North and development by the people of the North. Thank you. Thank you so much for those very important comments. Sasha, please. Thank you, Herzer. Uh, thank you, organizers, for putting together this meeting, which uh, definitely was discussed for a long time. And it's really nice to see the opportunities that back-to-back -back chairmanships are coming together to discuss issues, what happened before and what are the achievements, but also to be prepared for the next. And we definitely even happier will be to see here Finland for the next uh, period. Uh, it's also great to be at the meeting which bring together Canada and U.S. Uh, as my first really sea ice experience in the Arctic was from offshore Pruda Bay and then offshore Iglulik, so and that was uh, really amazing places to visit and also to be there and work there. We also very much appreciate the opportunity that uh, WWF is engaged and invited to be part of this meeting, as I can see that at least among speakers, we are the only observer uh, invited to speak uh, here, and definitely observers, and I think that my reflections will be mostly from the point of view of observer. And WWF is observer for many years from the very beginning of the Arctic Council. And I hope that we are pretty constructive observer making our contribution to the work of the Arctic 
Council, using, of course, one of our advantage. <clears throat> WWF is pan Arctic organization. So we have our offices and our representation in every Arctic state, and that's actually helping us to engage expertise, engage science, and engage thinking, and engage pilots and fuel projects from all countries. So Michael was asking about engagement of Russia. So that definitely being Russian myself, I can say also that our presence in Russia, which is very strong, is actually very much also ensuring that uh, some elements of work within the Arctic Council will continue practi practically in a very active way. Uh, I also like to uh, draw your attention, probably some of you saw our publication. That's again about observers. That's about new observers, the new country observers. And again, we believe that uh, what was done already during the Canadian chairmanship can definitely be continued and maybe strengthened during American chairmanship, the meaningful engagement of observers into the work of the Arctic Council, not just letting them sit around SAO meeting, observe and listen, but actually engage them and help them to do their contribution through the working groups, do their science, do their expertise and bring it to the Arctic Council table. And that requires some work from Arctic states. It's not just happening that observers will do themselves. They need some kind of infrastructure helping them uh, to do uh, that. We are very much interested in seeing the Arctic Council strong. And we believe that uh, Canadian chairmanship did quite a lot in this direction. Definitely, secretariat was established during the Swedish chairmanship, but the real work of the secretariat the real start of it was under Canadian chairmanship, and we see that uh, Secretariat is pretty strong in delivering a lot of uh, good results. What we see, the next step for that, that will be giving Arctic Council Secretariat maybe more functions. For example, coordination functions between working groups. We know that there are many cross-cutting topics, for example, oil and gas, ecosystem-based management which are treated by different working groups a different way, and there is no really coordination in between. So whether it's a specifically work for the Arctic Council Secretariat to do this kind of job, reporting functions, reporting functions on how Arctic Council is doing, but not also only Arctic Council is doing, how Arctic states are doing. And that's again can be the function for the Secretariat. And that's another point of strengthening uh, Arctic Council. We definitely very much welcome the approach of Canadian chairmanship developing the tracking tool for projects happening in the Arctic Council. But we definitely also believe that U.S. chairmanship can bring it even further and think about monitoring and reporting of what Arctic states really do to make all recommendations of the Arctic Council being implemented on the ground. So it's not only about the Arctic Council itself and delivery on projects of the Arctic Council, it's also the delivery of nations, Arctic nations, in uh, their national work. I think extremely important work is continue to help to build capacity of permanent participants. And we also very, well, very much welcome activities of Canadian chairmanship, including the upcoming uh, workshop in Yellowknife before the SAO meeting on uh, permanent participants' capacity from our side, we are working currently closely uh, with Indigenous People Secretariat developing the idea of uh, permanent participants' capacity fund, which again, I hope that Arctic states as well as other observers will be uh, supporting. And definitely a few next uh, steps can be discussed in terms of strengthening the Arctic Council, where from our perspective, the work is not enough, despite the fact that this is a language of the Kirun Declaration. That's definitely about activities of the Arctic Council in relation to other international fora, bringing the Arctic issues to those uh, forums, but also using those fora to bring forward Arctic agenda and maybe thinking about the common positions and common ground of Arctic states towards specific elements. One of them is obviously polar code, for example. It was fantastic that IMO president was speaking at the SAO meeting, but I think there could be much more done to really work at national level to make polar code happen in practice. 
Well, conservation agenda, definitely being from WWF, that's one of the issues where we are most interested. And for us, such elements like ABA, the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment, assessment is fantastic. What we really welcome is that this assessment resulted in policy recommendations. And what we really uh, welcome is that currently, and we also very much support this move within the Arctic Council from science to practice, from scientific reports, which are extremely important, and we definitely welcome them, but from those reports to implementation, to making something on the ground, to make a real projects and achieve something in every Arctic state. And that's why for, I believe, successful conference in Iqaluit, where the implementation plan for Arctic biodiversity assessment is supposed to be accepted and adopted, that American chairmanship will take a lead in a, a rigorous and strong implementation of this plan with a very clear time frame and timeline and concrete deliverables. Arctic Marine Strategic Plan, extremely important delivery of Canadian chairmanship. And again, the key point that this plan needs to be implemented. This plan needs to have a strong schedule with, again, concrete deliverables until 2025, and also definitely not only for one chairmanship, as that can be a very good basis for working further for the long-term uh, ideas, as actually Mr. Rugby said, that the long-term vision, long-term thinking is important. And we believe that Arctic Marine Strategic Plan exactly set up this opportunity. But marine strategic plan is not pay plan. And that's another important issue which we believe that chairmanship can play a significant role, ensuring that all working groups work together because that's Arctic Council plan, not pay plan, not one working group plan. Framework for marine protected areas, which very much coincide with recommendations from uh, Arctic biodiversity assessment as related to development of Pan-Arctic Ecological Network. And that's again where I believe that based on the good results coming from the work of Canadian chairmanship, US chairmanship can really take a lead and make it uh, happen. Uh, few more things as I think important deliverables from the current chairmanship, but again, the potential step forward and the leadership for US chairmanship, climate change. So the work on black carbon and developing the strong framework for black carbon is extremely important. But also if we read most of Arctic Council declarations, every time in the declarations there is a language about importance of climate change and mitigation measures. So what is the next step? How Arctic Council can play really a role to lead on climate change discussions within the Arctic, but also broader, definitely within international uh, context as well. And bringing Arctic experience, bringing actually Arctic issue, because we all know that Arctic is melting or warming faster than any other part of the planet. So what Arctic Council can do there. And uh, finally, development. WWF is not anti-development organization at all. So we absolutely like to see development. But the key issue for us currently, looking at the work of the Arctic Council during the last cycle of 16 years, we unfortunately see that Arctic Council has no vision for the Arctic. Arctic Council and eight Arctic states, they do not know how Arctic should look like in 2050, for example and working through two years period. That's nice that now we have discussion for a longer term, but usually it's two years, two years, two years. And where we go with those two years, that's unclear. So we very much believe and we very much expect from US chairmanship that this issue of developing the common vision, developing the long-term framework for the Arctic Council work, that will be one of US initiatives to bring to the table and ask other partners to work together to develop this vision and then basically make a long-term plan for the Arctic Council where they like to be together with permanent participants, together with other interested partners. And in this uh, sense, I think that crea uh, creation of Arctic Economic Council 
which in principle we very much support because we very much supportive of engagement of business into our council work. But I think that many in this room know that WWF was pretty critical about Arctic Economic Council because of unclarity around transparency, because unclarity around safeguards which really will help this Arctic Council, uh, Economic Council to be more in line with stewardship and sustainability agenda and environmental issues. Their participation in this uh, council of, say, observers or participation of civil society. So there are many issues which we believe uh, can be settled through the work of the Arctic Economic Council, which in our mind, if properly designed and will actually develop independently, but with an eye of the Arctic Council, can be important and useful, but also can be detrimental. And that's up to, I think, Arctic states and Arctic Council to ensure that that will go the uh, right way. So thank you very much, and I hope and really believe that the full flame of the torch given from Canada to US will be even stronger, and actually will pass on uh, next years and go on. Thank you. Sasha, thank you. There was so much uh, content in there, and I think we're going to be unpacking that throughout the day, particularly as we look towards the future. Dr. Sharon, uh, we'll wind it up with you, and then we'll turn to a conversation. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd just like to start by saying that I come with a bit of a warning, because uh, first of all, I'm an academic, but also I live in the South. Uh, even though I come from Winnipeg, which is known for its cold climate, I don't actually live in the North. And so for both of those reasons, I'm very much an outsider. And so that has to be kept in mind. And the other warning is for all of you, um, be careful when you answer emails from John Higginbottom in the late afternoon, because you could end up here. So that's, that's the warning for all of you. So what I was asked to do was uh, sort of o do an overview of Canada's uh, priorities for its chairship, how we did, and then what does this mean really for Canada and potentially for the Arctic Council and for the U.S.? So we've heard a lot about Canada's priorities, so I'm not actually going to review those. We've heard from uh, Mr. Rigby and, and Ms. Harper, and she certainly outlined in detail both the context for Canada's Arctic priorities and what it was we wanted to do, and the focus, of course, was on the people of the North. But before we look at how we actually did, we need to remind ourselves of some of the challenges that the Arctic Council has. It is, first and foremost, um, a very soft legal body in that it cannot actually make binding decisions except for among the eight Arctic states. So it doesn't have that power of enforcement that other organizations may have. Uh, the other uh, thing we should keep in mind is that the Arctic is continuing to be a zone of cooperation, but that wasn't always an assured case, and it's something that always has to be nurtured and watched very, very carefully. And there are, of course, outside events, which uh, Dr. Byers asked of Mr. Rigby, you know, what happens when we have uh, an aggressive Russia? What is going to be the impact for the Arctic Council? But there are all sorts of events going on in the world that could reach inside the Arctic Council. The next is that we have uh, now 32 observers and 14 Arctic states and permanent participants. So we have more than a two to one ratio of observers to members and permanent participants. And that presents challenges as well. And finally, there's always this inclusive, exclusive debate that we have when it comes to the Arctic Council because it is a quasi international organization that's focused around an ocean, so it's very much of a regional nature, but many of the issues that they're tackling, like climate change, are really happening universally. And so there's always that debate about whether or not the Arctic Council should assume sole um, sort of leadership on particular issues, or are we harming ourselves by making it a regional issue? Should we, again, focus it more universally? So. Those are just things to sort of ponder. 
We've had a number of notable achievements for the Arctic Council. Many of them predated Canada's chairship, but Canada was certainly um, part and parcel of these achievements. And the Ar Arctic Economic Council is really sort of the flagship achievement of this chairship, and achieving that in less than two years uh, is, is quite a feat and should be noted. In terms, though, of how Canada did, one of the comments that has been made is that Canada's recent two years has really just been a placeholder. Uh, we haven't really seen the sort of events or processes or agreements that came out of, for example, the six years when the, the Nordic countries were in charge. Now, on the one hand, we haven't quite finished our two years, so it may be premature to sort of make a diagnosis. On the other hand, um, we can't always expect the Arctic Council to be doing, having agreements and things like that. Sometimes we do need, we do plateau for a variety of reasons, and we'll maybe look at that. Another comment has been that Canada, who was instrumental in creating the Arctic Council from the Finnish initiative, the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, and specifically said that in addition to environmental protection, we need to add sustainable development. And now all of a sudden it seems that we've done a shift to the economic side of things. So some people are sort of raising an eyebrow and saying, what does this all mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, it's really only academics that tend to um, assume that these issues are exclusive. Uh, many of the economic issues, in fact, will impact on sustainable development and will impact on environmental protection. So um, maybe the eyebrows don't have to go up so far. However, it's always good to remind ourselves of what were the two founding pillars of the Arctic Council. And the idea was that they would always be uh, on par with each other, that one wouldn't take precedent over the other. Another issue that is not unique to the Canadian chairship, will not be unique to the US chairship, is this funding issue. It is a perennial problem. Um, David van der Zweig, uh, wrote about it nearly 10 years ago, that this is going to be the potential undoing of the Arctic Council because it is just, it's, it's dependent on member states to provide uh, funds, it's dependent on observer states to provide funds, and we're in an age of austerity. And so some of the first sort of funding opportunities are with the, the Arctic, it's easily overlooked. So we always have to be the cheerleaders saying that th this is important that we continue to do this. But I think one of the factors that, it, that isn't mentioned, um, because it, doesn't, it isn't an agreement, it isn't something we can all wave and say, ooh, look what we did. The fact that the Arctic Council, given the geopolitical situations that we have faced, the fact that it is still together and functioning is an incredible achievement. Um, and it's an achievement of everybody on the Arctic Council, but... Uh, Canada was, was wise to keep a cooler head and not to turn this into a political football. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Now, areas that uh, Canada and others can pursue, there's certainly the issue of things like fisheries management. Um, I, I'm no expert, but I understand some stocks are starting to move northward, and, and so people are asking for some controls on that area. Um, I think the coastal states are having sort of quiet conversations, but we don't want to get into that situation where we have the, the Arctic Five versus everybody else in the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council works best when it stays and hangs together, so let's not make that mistake of, uh, of doing the, the Arctic Five, because especially that, that name has a, has a negative connotation now. Uh, we need, I think, more support for a number of agreements that are outside of the Arctic Council, but certainly uh, will impact the Arctic. One is the Minamata Convention, and again, David van der Zweig is, is the expert here, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I think the U.S. is the only state to have actually ratified that convention. Is that not the case? few more, Vincent. but anyways, that's a case where we know that mercury contamination has a particular impact on the Arctic, and that's something that the Arctic Council could be championing. 
Next, we have um, a, a fissure among some of the members of the Arctic Council vis-a-vis -vis what to do with climate change. Some want to make it a particular focus. Others would sort of, eh, let's not talk about that right now. So that, that's a reality that we're just going to have to face and deal with. Uh, next, there's the need now that we have some of these agreements to actually put live exercises in place. Uh, so how does the search and rescue agreement actually work in the real world beyond tabletop exercises? Uh, it's important that we do work together on this. But again, this is where the funding issue comes up. This is incredibly expensive and countries have lots of priorities. Uh, Finally, the, there, the other problem that we have, and it's going to be a, a challenge for the U.S., is that uh, across the Arctic, different states have different um, levels of infrastructure, particular national inter interests that they would like to champion, different population levels and the like. And so that's something that we have to keep in mind, and there's always that... Um, desire to put sort of a national flavor on the Arctic chairship, but does that in fact, is that in the best interest of the Arctic Council in general? So I think for the, for the future of the Arctic Council, um, we may be at a, at a tipping point, uh, and I'm not trying to be alarmist here, but it is something we need to give thought to, the fact that we have this um, imbalance of observers to member states and permanent participants certainly makes it harder for the permanent participants to be heard um, and whether or not the observers will continue to be happy with simply being observers is a question we need to ask. Next, the national priorities of state members. Um, they're diverse, but so far they've not been discordant, and that is part of the job of the chair is making sure that there is that um, purpose of, of mind when it comes to the Arctic Council. The question I have is, though, have, we, have the low-hanging fruit issues been tackled? And now this is why we're seeing a particular plateau in the work of the Arctic Council, and, and maybe this is why the, this Canadian chairship hasn't had as many agreements come out of it. That's because we're starting to get into the issues of, of core national interests that are going to be very intractable and difficult to deal with. Uh, so we may now see in the second term of chairships a lot more uh, requirement to be negotiators. We need to temper our enthusiasm as well. I think that uh, one of the things that we never intended was for the Arctic Council to become a UN-like agency and to, to be a huge body because it makes decision-making harder, uh, but also that the member states particularly like the decision-making uh, priority that they have. Uh, we have to always keep in mind that the permanent participants absolutely must be included in these decisions, but that's something that we have to, to think about. And finally, if for some reason Russia is kicked out, uh, if for, for that matter, if any of the members decide to leave the Arctic Council, I think the continuation of the Arctic Council will definitely be up for debate. Uh, Russia in particular, because it is such a, a large Arctic player on, on many fronts. So that was, those were my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Rich, rich content. And I'm going to do lightning question round because we only have a few minutes and I want us to stay on, on schedule. So I'm going to ask two quick questions uh, for, to all of our participants. And I'm, I'm hoping we can squeak one question. Brooks Yeager, you get the question. One from our audience. And then I promise in the lunch time, uh, I'm sure everyone can have lots of thoughtful conversation. So for all the panelists, if you could give and would offer one piece of advice to Mr. Rigby and Admiral Papp on the chairmanships. What would that one piece of advice be on, the chair, on their respective chairmanships? And then my second question, it seems sort of a, a theme that's running through all the presentations. Um, does the Arctic Council right now, as it's currently composed, have the urgency to tackle the many questions, does it have the accountability for both the organization but also members, observers? Do we have the tools? When the Arctic Council was created in 1996, 
It was designed for a particular moment and a particular function. Has that function dramatically changed? Do we have to rethink it? Or are we just talking about uh, making some minor modifications to how the working groups and, and how it does? So I just love your quick reflections on that. So we'll go quickly, and then Mr. Yeager will let you have your question, and then we'll take an extremely quick break, and we welcome Admiral Papp. So Premier, why don't you, uh, what piece of advice would you offer? the Canadian government and the American government on their chairmanship. Your moment. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, Nunavut is 85% um, Inuit. The population is, there's lots of Inuit there. And the one piece of advice I'd like to offer is that whatever happens in Arctic Council has to be focused on the wellness of the Arctic uh, council members, especially the inhabitants of the Arctic. And having said that, it's one of the key critical things that as an organization, or the Arctic Council, there has to be more dialogue with the people that inhabit the Arctic and, it, of course, council members. Thank you. You can take a pass, Sue, but go ahead and so take a shot. So I'm advising my boss, is exactly. that it? Exactly. Okay. That's good. That's good. Um, I would say the one piece of advice is that we try to focus. Uh, there's so much going on. It's such a hot area. Uh, everybody wants to do everything, and uh, I think that's what we've been trying to do, and inevitably you will run into criticism if you do implementation rather than more agreements or vice versa. But we need to focus. We do not have infinite resources, neither the states or the PPs. We need this. Um, secondly, I think this idea of do we have urgency for rethinking. I'm a Canadian and an incrementalist. I think uh, um, we are trying to rethink every time. That's why I like the two-year system. We go to a continual rethinking. In our terms, checking it up the political level, I think that is the way to proceed. But yes, we need to continually rethink. It's an evolving situation. Uh, I think uh, some of those, so, some of that will be answered by the uh, workshops that are happening in uh, Young Life and the uh, limited resources that we have as permanent participants. Uh, but to take that advice for more effective and more efficient, forward-looking participation of permanent participants, I think some of that will be answered by the um, the workshop and build upon what works. I think uh, at the community level, at the territorial level, at the international level. Um, my remarks alluded to the fact that when uh, we work with successive governments, their priorities change. And Inuit needs and challenges don't change. So build on what works at the community and up to the international level. Uh, I'd like to uh, add to that by um, adding on to what she was saying about the focus of uh, non-renewable resource development is really strong right now. Uh, when at the community level, uh, we do need to build up what we have at the community for re renewable resource development. Um, let's build up our community so that they could uh, market seal skids. Let's build up our community so that uh, they could build upon their arts and crafts industry. You know, something that works at the community level. Thank, Thank you. you. I, th I think that, again, from my perspective, uh, f fully agree with what uh, Susan said. We need focus. And definitely, uh, we need diversification. It's not only about extractives, what we do in the Arctic. So that's why, again, coming back, we can have focus only if we know what we like to do in the long term. And we also can think about different opportunities in the Arctic, different opportunities for uh, people in the Arctic, only if we have this kind of vision. So that still, we believe, until this vision is in place, focus will be a challenge, but also talking meaningfully about opportunities outside extractives also will be pretty difficult. So that's, I believe, what we need to do pretty urgently now. Thank you. Um, I, 
I'm going to be selfish. <laughs> One of the things I would like to see and congratulate the Secretariat on putting, making more information available, but I think, you know, just communication about what the Arctic Council does, what they're thinking about doing and having that information available because as we can see in this room, there are lots of people interested, but if it's not posted anywhere and it's such a closed shop, this thing called the Arctic Council, um, that I think would help and go a long way to making decisions. Uh, Mr. Yeager, if you have a microphone, and Brooks, we got to keep it super, super short. Yes. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm Brooks Yeager with uh, Birdwell Strategies, formerly of the State Department, and have worked for quite some time with the Council with a lot of pleasure. Um, this is a question about the role of the permanent participants. Um, they have a privileged role, justly so, in the Council. This was a major innovation and uh, it should be conserved and magnified, amplified. There was a very delicate moment during the Swedish chairmanship when Russia, the Russian government, moved aggressively to take control of the Russian Association of the Indigenous Peoples of the North, RIPON, which is the Russian representative. It represents all the Russian indigenous communities, but it can only do so if it's elected by those indigenous communities. And that is no longer a clear reality. So question number one is, how do we, as a council, conserve and protect the role of the indigenous community representatives? And second, is there a need to involve local governments of the North, the way the Barents Council does, to more effectively represent the interests, not just of the indigenous people who are 700,000 of the 4 million people of the North, but of all the people of the North. Brooks, great question. Ask, I think we'll have you take that question. Maybe, Premier, you'd like to also reflect. Thank you very much. Um, that's a very difficult question. But um, when you, when a politician is put into the Arctic Council, at times it falls in right in, in line with their priorities within their respective government. And I, I see that as a, as a plus because most politicians are well known throughout the circumpolar membership and it creates for more collaborative um, approaches on the discussions that are taking place. But I, I can't really comment on some of the issues that the first question that you brought up, it's a very difficult question I'm sure the people at the higher levels are taking a good, hard look at that. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I think I, I'll just go back to uh, what, how Vince answered that, that question earlier. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, and add that uh, we just, a, a bunch of us came back, just came back from New York, from the United Nations or a conference on indigenous peoples where we talked about our indigenous, indigenous rights and the uh, outcome document. I think uh, uh, that has big aspirations that we can build on and I hope that all the countries um, uh, carry through with that outcome document uh, eventually, sooner rather than later. And um, what was the second, was there a second question? I can't, okay, yeah. I, I can't, I won't comment on the local governments because I, I represent uh, any organizations and uh, for any organizations, build on what works. ICC has been working for a long time, so build on what we have done. Uh, we do have local affiliates uh, that we work with and uh, we need to have a, I'll put a pitch in for a policy development with any participation and open communication uh, we don't have uh, our own TV station. We don't have our own local radio station so that any at the local level could be involved in the development of policy. Uh, we're only involved at the tail end of it when it's introduced and it's too much of a late draft by then. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So you want to have just a quick comment on that? Um, just on the question of local government, I think just to cite three examples, um, Kingdom of Denmark, uh, has representatives from Greenland, Denmark, and Faroe Islands. Canada has um, the territorial governments as part of its delegation. Um, ICC 
usually has at least three representatives from um, Greenland and uh, Alaska and Canada, and I would say several of the other PP organizations have um, uh, subgroups um, based on different uh, organizational uh, responsibilities. So we do already have that in many cases, but it is left to each of the 14 to decide what's appropriate for them. Fantastic. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific discussion. All right, uh, don't go away. We're going to just switch up here a bit, and then we will welcome Admiral Papp to the podium. Ever, State Department uh, Special Representative for the Arctic. This was a position that Secretary John Kerry announced in March. Many of us who follow the Arctic were holding our breath, waiting for this announcement, and when it emerged, uh, we were absolutely delighted. Um, Admiral Papp is, is so well known uh, as the 24th Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, and I have to say I had the very distinct privilege of hosting Admiral Papp when he unveiled the Coast Guard's Arctic strategy uh, in May of 2013. We started our conversation, our Arctic dialogue there, and uh, it is such a great privilege that now in a new role, in a new suit, put his civilian clothes on now, uh, that he can con continue to serve, uh, serve his country in such a distinguished way. Uh, there are many things I admire about Admiral Papp, but as he was talking about the Arctic when he was wearing his Coast Guard Commandant hat, he always said it is important that the, the United States think of the Arctic as a national imperative. And he used our historic uh, knowledge and our understanding of when we were constructing that due line, we had a national purpose, we had a national mission, and we have to think of the Arctic today uh, as a new mission and a new purpose, and it has to be the collective, the nation behind that. So I know uh, he's going to provide that uh, great vigor to this new role, uh, and we are absolutely delighted that he has selected CSIS to be the first place where he offers his first public comments as U.S. Special Representative to the Arctic. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Admiral Bob Papp. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, Heather, you've delivered just about half of my speech now. <laughs> but that, that's okay. I can, I can add more as I go along. I'm never lost for words. And uh, yes, new title, new, new uniform, uh, and what it brought to mind, uh, I, I was actually wearing this suit last week when I went to New York, uh, the, the uh, General Assembly. We had a short meeting up there, and I traveled by train. And uh, my friends know that I love telling them about humbling experiences. So whenever you get a title or a new job, you know, your head gets a little full. And then for me, there's always some event that happens that uh, seems to put you back on Earth. So uh, that happened for me on the train. The train broke down uh, just outside of Washington, and we loaded eight carloads of people into a five-car train that was already full. So I stood all the way to New York, and at a certain point, I took off my jacket and laid it up on the rack. And uh, I did have the vest on, and I did have my watch fob hanging out, and perhaps I looked like somebody else, because this gentleman came up to me and said, uh, conductor. Uh, <laughs> And I was actually able to answer his question, too, which is <laughs> multi-purpose. Uh, it is good to be back at CSIS. I was going to mention that, yes, about a year and a half ago, we introduced the Coast Guard Arctic Strategy with Heather and me on a stage in another location. And what a grand venue you have now. Uh, I was thrilled that day. I'm even more thrilled to be here today as uh, Secretary Kerry's special representative. Uh, I'm also proud to be here today with uh, the team from the State Department. I'm proud to be a part of that team. Uh, Ambassador David Balton has been uh, leading efforts uh, before my uh, introduction to the job. Uh, most of the team is here today, with the exception of Julie Gorley, our, our, our senior Arctic official, who is a little under the weather. Uh, but we've been putting together a very good team, and we were very pleased to meet yesterday with Vince Rigby and Sue Harper, and, uh, and we appreciate the help that they're giving us. Uh, 
I also see some of my old team here today, too, in Coast Guard Blue, uh, led by uh, the Vice Commandant, Vice Admiral Peter Neffinger, who uh, in reality was the primary author on that Arctic strategy that we announced that day. It was, it was a teamwork event, but, uh, but he had the leadership on that, and I appreciate it, and I'm delighted to see him in his new job as the Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard. So uh, I have new shipmates at the State Department. I have old shipmates here that are here today. Uh, the old shipmates who know me know I can't give a speech without telling a sea story or giving a little bit of history. And I wouldn't want to disappoint anybody, so I'm going to do a little bit of both. So the sea story is an actual sea story. And hopefully the sea story and the history will put things into context a little bit for what we're trying to do here today. In 1996, I had the privilege as the captain of our training ship Eagle to take Eagle to St. Petersburg, Russia for the 300th anniversary of the Russian Navy. And uh, it was a grand event, 117 tall ships gathered in St. Petersburg. And uh, there was a tremendous dinner that was put on for all the captains at the Palace of Catherine the Great. What an experience. But an even better experience was later that evening when a bunch of the captains got together in the great cabin of Asgard II, which is Ireland's training ship. We uh, gathered together uh, for some professional development and a few adult beverages. <laughs> So as the evening progressed, at some, a certain point, I'm a people watcher, I sat back and I just observed all that was going on in the great cabin. There were people speaking Russian, Danish, German, Spanish, uh, probably at least a dozen different languages. But as I sat there and looked around the table, in spite of the multiple languages, everybody seemed to understand each other. And I think that's to be expected because they were all sailors. They're formed in the same crucible of challenges of the sea. They have a love for the sea, training sailors to take on the challenges of the sea. So we understood each other. So the next day, I was interviewed by BBC, uh, by, the, by the Winter Palace, and uh, I reflected upon the evening before, and the reporter said, well, what did you gain from that? And I said, well, what I gained from it was if everyone in the world was a sailor, we could probably solve all the world's problems. And parochially, I felt that way. But as I've matured and grown and moved from job to job, what I've learned is that there are an awful lot of problem solvers in the world. And I've grown a particular respect for diplomats and statesmen uh, who attempt to solve the problems of the world. Which brings me to the history lesson. Uh, one of the heroes that I have is Admiral Arleigh Burke, uh, United States Navy. Uh, he was the chief, of he was first of all a World War II hero, uh, recipient of the Navy Cross, and he also was the chief of naval operations under President Eisenhower and President Kennedy, retiring mm -hmm. in 1962, and then, along with Ambassador David Abshire, founding CSIS. So you had this admiral who, when, when he died, had left instructions that the only thing to go on his gravestone was the word sailor. So here was a guy who took pride in being a sailor, but he also fully understood that it takes many views, it takes many people, it takes many hands working the problems of the world. And I think that played into the development of CSIS, that combination of operational experience, warrior, combined with diplomacy and statesmanship that makes this institution so great. So that's why it's good to be here today, because CSIS has been devoted to these issues over the years. It brings people of many views together uh, to take on the challenges, and that's what we are doing today. So I welcome all the uh, members of the executive branch that are here today, uh, members of Congress and congressional staffs, uh, the representatives from the international community, our, our Alaska delegation, Representative Heron, Senator McGuire, I haven't seen her yet today, but I know she's here somewhere. Uh, so uh, we welcome all of you, as well as those from the international community, those from our fellow Arctic nations, uh, the permanent participants, and those here from other countries that are simply interested in the Arctic. I'd like to uh, once again say a special thank you to Vincent Rigby and Susan Harper, uh, we had a great session at the State Department yesterday. I learned a lot, and I will continue to learn from the two of you. Uh, we appreciate your cooperation, uh, your candor, and we look forward to working together. 
Uh, we had a great uh, evening at the Canadian Embassy, thanks for that as well, where we also had a few adult beverages and uh, told a few stories, and, but it was a great evening, and uh, as I said, we look forward to working with you. So we just heard from our friends about the great work in which the Arctic Council has been engaged over the last two years during their chairmanship. And I want to thank Canada for its leadership during this time. They've set a great example for us, and we look forward to continuing the important work of the Arctic Council during our tenure in the chair. We fully support the emphasis Canada has placed on a number of key Arctic issues during its chairmanship, such as safe shipping and improved economic and living conditions for Arctic inhabitants. We plan to pursue those projects as well, and uh, we, they will be related to other projects that we're doing in our chairmanship. Uh, I was particularly taken by Sue Hopper's comments this morning on uh, the, uh, the Dew Line and the Alcan Highway, and uh, Heather brought that up as well. Because one of the things I've been struggling with, and uh, Dave Balton knows this as well, as we've approached this opportunity uh, to inspire the citizens of the United States to become more involved and more interested in the Arctic, what is the national imperative? I haven't answered that question yet. And I've talked to an awful lot of people, and people have made suggestions, but we haven't nailed that one key issue yet uh, that makes this a national imperative. The dew line was a national imperative because President Eisenhower and other leaders said it would be. The Alcan Highway was, uh, was a national imperative for defense reasons as, as well. They were both born of crises and then response to crises, responses to threats. Do we really need a threat? Do we really need a crisis before we get engaged and uh, become more involved in the Arctic? And I say this only parochially uh, as a U.S. citizen, because I think the other nations get it. Uh, we tend to be a little separated from our portion of the Arctic up in Alaska, and it's easy to forget sometimes. Uh, but I've had a long-term interest in, in Alaska and the Arctic, which I hope to talk about a little bit here this morning. So uh, why is it important to the United States? Well, if you look at a picture of the Earth directly down on the North Pole, the predominant feature is the Arctic Ocean and its ice cap. It's a maritime environment. The United States is a maritime nation, and by virtue of our state of Alaska, we are an Arctic nation as well. And I believe the greatness of any maritime nation can be measured by its commitment to providing mariners safe and secure approaches to its shores and that a nation's prosperity is proportionate to how well it ensures the safe and secure and efficient movement of trade and commerce to and from its shores. And that a really great nation will also ensure the environmental protection of the sea. Wherever human activity th thrives, governments have a responsibility to uphold the rule of law, to ensure the safety and security of their people, and to ensure environmentally responsible activity. The Arctic is such a place, and the eight nations, the six permanent participants, share in those responsibilities. We all recognize the Arctic Ocean is changing from a solid expanse of inaccessible ice fields into a growing navigable sea, attracting increased human activity. The economic promise of oil and gas production in the Arctic is increasingly attractive as receding sea ice and improvements in drilling technology make offshore exploration and production more economically feasible than before. The past several years have seen a relatively large increase in shipping traffic through the Bering Strait, partly due to the increased traffic going along the northern sea route above Russia. The Arctic's home to over 50,000 Americans, many of whose ancestors learned to survive and thrive in the harsh Arctic environment thousands of years ago. Today, a rapidly warming Arctic threatens traditional ways of life. The Arctic is an area of great biodiversity. Roughly half the fish caught in the United States waters come from the exclusive economic zone off the coast of Alaska. The Arctic is critical to the life cycles and migration patterns of millions of migratory birds each year. Recent effects of climate change are also changing these migration patterns, threatening their survival. Glaciers and land-based ice sheets in the Arctic are also decreasing, markedly over the past decades contributing to sea level rise. Permafrost is thawing, posing a threat to infrastructure in the region and to the communities that rely upon it. And unlike Las Vegas, what happens in the Arctic 
does not just stay in the Arctic. It affects the Arctic and its residents, and it has the potential to affect all of us. Likewise, what happens in the rest of the world does not just stay in the rest of the world. It affects the Arctic. Black carbon emissions, methane emissions are something that we need to work towards reducing uh, because we need to do everything we can to uh, mitigate the effects on the Arctic. So why do we need to act now? We need to act now because I've seen the drastic changes that have occurred in the Arctic. Uh, this has not just been over the last four years or five years in my, uh, my Coast Guard career. Uh, it started out over 40 years ago as uh, young Ensign Pap uh, assigned to a Coast Guard cutter home ported in Adak, Alaska. I crossed the Arctic Circle for the first time on July 7, 1976. Uh, we were bound for Kotzebue uh, through the Bering Strait. We never made it through the Bering Strait. It was choked with ice. Um, I had the opportunity to go up in a helicopter and uh, look for ice leads. We landed in Kotzebue, and as we landed in Kotzebue, as far as I could see, there was fast ice on the shore out to the horizon. Fast forward 34 years later, my first visit back to Alaska as the Commandant of the Coast Guard. We flew into Kotzebue at about 4,000 feet coming in, and as far as I could see, I saw no ice other than the ice cubes in my ice water beside my chair. Clearly, there's a drastic change that we all understand and know about, but it is increasingly uh, becoming a problem. While the effects of climate change are creating conditions more favorable to some types of economic activity in the Arctic, there are also negative effects, such as coastal erosion, permafrost thaw, and a reduction in access to subsistence hunting resources, to name a few. We must take care that economic activity in the Arctic is sustainable and does not exacerbate the effects of climate change and environmental degradation. The Arctic region contains amazing, diverse ecosystems, but they're systems that exist in a delicate balance, having evolved over thousands of years to survive and thrive in such an extreme environment. The rapid changes it's now experiencing jeopardize this delicate balance, and it's our long-term national interest to protect our resources in the Arctic and the time for action is now. Now, the several ways in which the international community can take action to protect our resources while at the same time responsibly developing them. The following considerations should guide the work of the Arctic Council towards this end. First, we should ensure that economic development is conducted carefully and with due consideration to short and long-term environmental effects. This is particularly true when it comes to managing the Arctic Ocean. Second, we should look for ways to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change in the Arctic, where possible, while at the same time working to improve climate resilience. And third, we should assist the citizens in remote Arctic communities while adapting to these new and rapid changes that are having such a deleterious effect on their traditional ways of life. The Arctic Council has done great work towards these ends over the past 20 years. The Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, and the ongoing adaptation actions for a changing Arctic are all great examples of groundbreaking studies that increased our understanding of the current challenges that we all face in the Arctic. During our chairmanship of the Arctic Council, we plan to continue this great work, but also to focus more on developing and implementing solutions to these problems, perhaps making the Council a little bit more forward-leaning and establishing actionable outcomes. In 1996, the eight Arctic nations came together to create the Arctic Council when they issued the Ottawa Declaration. They all realized that cooperation amongst the Arctic states in close collaboration with the representatives of the Arctic indigenous peoples would be to the benefit of all, and this is the spirit of our cooperation that continues today. What happens in one area of the Arctic can have dramatic effects on the entire region. The effects of climate change are being felt across the Arctic and creating similar challenges and opportunities in all Arctic states and even beyond. Addressing these challenges and opportunities together in a considered and well thought out manner is essential to the long term success of the region. That's why during the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council, we propose to focus on the Arctic as a region of shared responsibilities. It really is one Arctic with shared opportunities challenges, and responsibilities. The specifics of the U.S. Chairmanship Program will not be formally presented until next month at the meeting of the senior Arctic officials in Yellowknife. 
But what I can tell you today is that the proposed initiatives and projects under current consideration will fall into three broad categories. First, improving Arctic Ocean governance and stewardship. Second, addressing the effects of climate change, including mitigation and adaptation. And third, improving the economic and living conditions of Arctic residents. So as it relates to the Arctic Ocean, I, I think in my mind, two of the crowning achievements of the Arctic Council so far are the Search and Rescue Agreement and the Oil Spill Prevention and Response Agreement. It's imperative that we now actively engage in exercising those agreements to fully understand the capabilities, the competence, and the resources not only available, but the resources needed for the future to protect the Arctic Ocean and to protect the people that use it. It's imperative as well to address the effects of climate change in the Arctic before it's too late. Communities such as Shishref and uh, Kevalina and several others are suffering such severe coastal erosion that they are literally being consumed by the sea. I had a chance to go to Barrow uh, once again this past summer, and uh, my first time climbing through the uh, utilities tunnel that goes underneath the city, about five miles of tunnel. A storm this winter threatened to breach the utility system as the shoreline uh, eroded uh, throughout the winter and almost got into the pumping station that's close to the shore. Uh, it would be disastrous uh, for the city there. Access to traditional sources of fresh water is now threatened in some communities, and increased industrial uses of water now compete for the same limited resources. We'll be proposing projects that increase energy security for remote Arctic communities by providing them with better and more secure access to renewable energy resources, reducing their dependence on diesel generators, while at the same time reducing emissions of black carbon in the Arctic. We're looking at compiling a freshwater inventory and use assessment for the Arctic. We'll also have a project that will promote research into innovative ways to solve residential freshwater and sewer challenges in remote Arctic settings which in turn will reduce diseases associated with lack of fresh water. This is an important one as well, improving telecommunications infrastructure in the Arctic, because it'll make online tools for adaptation, such as the Arctic Adaptation Exchange Portal, more accessible and useful. It'll also make current telemedicine programs for remote villages more effective. But back to the ocean. We also wish to work with our fellow Arctic states for ways to improve coordination on efforts in addressing the challenges of newly forming ice-free Arctic Ocean areas. In other areas of the world, littoral states have come together to tackle similar problems, sometimes creating what we call regional seas agreements. We should look at whether similar arrangements would help us in the Arctic Ocean. What form this should take will need to be developed in close consultation with stakeholders here in the United States and around the Arctic region. As I stated earlier, one need only look at a map to see that the Arctic Ocean and its adjacent, adjacent waters cover the majority of the Arctic region. Recently, Secretary Kerry, a sailor himself, convened the Our Ocean Conference at the Department of State to raise awareness of the problems facing all oceans and to secure commitments from governments and other players in meeting those challenges. The Arctic Ocean, though still relatively pristine, is not immune to the problems that we see elsewhere in the world. Through our Arctic Council chairmanship, we'll be looking for opportunities for meaningful collaboration on issues affecting the Arctic Ocean. So the United States is assuming the chairmanship of the Arctic Council at a critical time. The Arctic Council has proven itself to be an effective and cooperative forum in which the Arctic states, permanent participants, and accredited observers can come together in effective ways for managing this precious resource. But I continue to look for that national imperative to engage the people of the other 49 states of the United States to become interested, to become concerned, and to look at this as a priority for the United States. And I think what, we, what I have uh, finally concluded is perhaps it's not defense or security related, perhaps rather than the national imperative, what we have here is a moral imperative. We all have a responsibility, an obligation to protect this area of our Earth for future progress for the people that live there and to preserve uh, this wonderful asset uh, that we have here. So uh, in conclusion, I turn to one more sailor here that uh, has always provided me inspiration. Uh, you might have heard his name before, uh, John F. Kennedy. 
You know, he, uh, he also, I, I used him as an example of a national imperative as well. Uh, we had another crisis, Sputnik. And back in 1963, uh, we got definitely involved in the space race, as President Kennedy set a goal for us in a speech at Rice University of going to the moon. He said, we choose to go to the moon. He had other distractions, as we all know. There were other things going on in the world, but he set the bar high. He made it a national imperative, uh, and he said in that speech that setting that goal would serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. We need to go to the Arctic because coordinating together and working together will organize the best of our energies and skills. Working together, we can do this. And if I can indulge myself, one more sailor thing. President Kennedy also in 1963 wrote a letter. Uh, in 1964, uh, we were going to host the first operation sail in New York Harbor, uh, and uh, he unfortunately passed before uh, Operation Sale occurred. Uh, but he wrote a beautiful letter, and I'm not going to repeat the entire thing. But in the letter, uh, he gives credit to sailing and the sea for developing him as an individual and giving him his sense of optimism and knowing that we can take on challenges. And in there, when he wrote of Operation Sale, he said, the sight of so many ships gathered from the distant corners of the world should remind us that strong, disciplined, and venturesome men and women can still find their way safely across uncertain and stormy seas. Uh, Kennedy always spoke literally and figuratively. So he was literally talking about those sailors coming across those uncertain and stormy seas. But I think he looked at those characteristics at those that would take on the future challenges metaphorically of uncertain and stormy seas. And it's really one of my favorite phrases that I've used for a long time. In approaching the Arctic, we approach uncertain and stormy seas, but working together, we can accomplish great things. And I look forward to our work as the United States takes over the chairmanship from our great friends from Canada. And uh, thank you for having me here this morning, and I'd be delighted to take a few questions if I have time. <laughs> Heather tells me I have time for one question. Roll the dice. Yes, sir, in the back. My name is Andrei Titov. I'm a Russian reporter. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> of course, technologies. Uh, we are not in the Arctic. Uh, we have technologies. Uh, my name is Andrei Sitov. I'm a Russian reporter here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you a question uh, to follow up on what you described as your experience in St. Petersburg. <laughs> and uh, to what our uh, Canadian chairmanship described this morning as their willingness uh, to go on with a constructive and uh, productive cooperation with Russia. Uh, what are your plans uh, uh, in this regard, and uh, what have been so far your experiences uh, with the Russians, uh, aside from the adult beverages? Thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I never liked vodka until I went to St. Petersburg but, uh, and got the real stuff. Uh, I, I'm, people are going to think that uh, think the wrong things of me here. All these adult <laughs> beverage stories. Look, we uh, we work with Russia now. We expect to continue to work with Russia. Uh, Ambassador Bolton just came back from Vladivostok, uh, where he worked on a fisheries agreement. Uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard uh, was just out in San Francisco two weeks ago uh, for the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum, in which Russia took part, and he uh, met uh, with his counterpart. Uh, and in general, as a sailor, I've learned to be a pretty optimistic guy. Uh, even in the worst of storms, at some point, it's going to get better. Uh, I anticipate it will get better. We will continue working with the Russians, and uh, we really need them as a part of the Arctic Council, as everybody has noted here, for it to be effective. Thanks for the question. <laughs>